Hi, welcome back to another V-Brown Bag Build Day video. This is the Datrium DVX Build Day, and I'm joined for this video by Boris Weissman. Welcome, Boris. Um, really nice meeting you, Austin. So, Boris, what's your role here at uh, Datrium? I'm a co-founder of uh, Datrium and uh, about a 20-year virtualization veteran. So, uh, you, you have particular depth in, in the, the technical parts. Today, we wanted to look at the I.O. architecture, actually dig a little deeper inside. We have more superficial architecture pieces, but we're going to dig into... What are we going to dig into? Uh, I'm going to focus on the inline IO processing and how it affects our performance. Um, and obviously, Datrium, DVX is a complex system. We cannot cover everything. It's, it's one of those today. rabbit holes where we could keep going if, if we had enough time and, right. and the determination. That's right. But IO processing, IO, especially inline IO processing, is a classic storage area, and hopefully we'll get to the bottom of it today. So just to set the stage, uh, I need to briefly go over the DVX components, and there are two major components. So we have compute nodes and we have data nodes. And on the compute node side, so essentially these are uh, commodity x86 servers uh, that run a hypervisor, either VMware ESX or KVM. You could buy them, it could be a white box, it could be uh, something you bring yourself, or it could be something you buy from Datrium for a complete turnkey solution up to the customer. Uh, we also have data nodes, and data nodes is a Datrium product, and this is where the durable storage lives. So this is a unique uh, aspect of our architecture where we separate uh, compute from durable storage, and we exploit the processing power and the cores of commodity x86 servers um, and the refresh cycle and also the low margins uh, that customers pay in for them and uh, for the commodity flush, while at the same time do not, we do not compromise for data durability uh, by providing a self-contained, well-tested, integrated appliance for durable storage. So that's the hardware side. On the software side, what Datrium provides is uh, our take on the software-defined storage controller. And our software-defined controller runs on the compute nodes. Uh, it installs via, uh, in the VM, what's in VMware, a language called a WIP. It's a virtualization bundle. Installs on the hypervisor, runs on the hypervisor. And, and runs in kernel on... On the VCI, uh, not quite. Not quite. Not quite. So some WIPs do, in fact, have kernel drivers. Mm -hmm. uh, we intentionally chose not to place our what we call hyperdriver, our software-defined storage control, in the kernel driver, uh, because uh, we want to be able to restart our software without having to actually start a hypervisor. And we run in what's the, our execution environment is uh, what's called um, user level. It's a user-level process. You can think of it as an analog of, say, a Linux process. So it runs on the hypervisor. It has a lot of benefits of uh, running in the kernel mode. Your IO path is short. Mm -hmm. There is no virtual machine to uh, That was my point about the Yeah, so, so in HCI, uh, sort of the more proven way or the more common acceptable way of deploying software-defined uh, controllers is to actually run a virtual machine. Of course, it comes with a cost, and there's overhead associated with it. There's memory, there are months of security patches, um, the administrator must be aware of it. Not so with us. So with us, it's just a self-contained web. It's installed automatically by our software. It's upgraded automatically without having to take um, the uh, compute node down. So these are some of the benefits. At the same time, just like the kernel driver, we use a hypervisor IO stack, and yeah, we'll talk about it. So you gain essentially you get the benefits of both worlds. So you have the benefits of VM-based software-defined controller, and there's a benefit so you can restart it without compromising the hypervisor. So the restart the, the ESX host. Exactly. But at the same time, you also have a shorter IO path because uh, we don't have to go through a second uh, VM. No, multiple learning. trips through correct, the Correct. Stack, the which is called directly into the hypervisor. Just a side effect of the architecture and its intentional side effect is uh, practically all the speed comes from compute nodes. Mm -hmm. This is where most cores are, this is where, where most memory is, this is where flash is, and by the way, you can bring your own flash. So if you need more performance, especially on the read side, uh, you essentially buy another installed compute node. If you need more capacity, more durable capacity, you buy another data node. 
And that's, that's sitting in that commodity x86 server from your vendor of choice, and your vendor is can be Daydream in this case. That's correct. But it, yeah. it could be anybody's x86 server that's on the hardware compatibility for your hypervisor. Absolutely correct. So as we, uh, we made a decision to provide Daydream Compute Nodes merely as for a turnkey solution. So customers who don't want to be involved in you know studying HCL, they could just buy a turnkey solution from us. And then one place to go for support. One, absolutely correct. We support that. We support the entire stack. Software, hardware, compute now, data nodes. So that's just on the uh, uh, ESX Software Fire Controller uh, side. The way it's exposed to the hypervisor is as NFS mount point. So we have the software that runs everywhere on each compute node, and it essentially pulls together all the durable storage of data nodes and exports it as a NFS data store. So as far as the hypervisor is concerned, uh, managing it is exactly the same as managing an NFS data store provided by, say, you know, NetApp array. So, mm-hmm. so there's absolutely no difference. Um, and NFS gets away from all of the SCSI queuing issues that you might absolutely. have with other presentations. Like yeah, you, SCSI. absolutely true. There is very little management. You don't need to know anything about SCSI or LAN or zoning or uh, basically everything. All the management is using essential virtualization uh, abstractions, such as virtual machines, virtual disks. And we hide, we spend a lot of effort in, in you know, that went into hiding all the underlying implementation abstractions. So you don't really need to be storage administrator to administer a system. What I, I like to call advanced simplicity, you build a lot, a lot of effort underneath to expose something very Absolutely. simple. Absolutely. Uh, it takes millions of lines of code to uh, expose clean abstractions. Um, so it, in shortly, we'll talk about reads and writes, but at a very high level, uh, reads and reads performance all comes from compute nodes. Writes uh, performance, uh, for the most part, it's also compute nodes, but the durable capacity is actually on the data nodes. And another interesting aspect is going back to hiding complexity. Uh, early on, we made a decision which sort of runs counter, at least at that time, was running counter to the HCI trend of exposing all kinds of knobs and dials and, and so that if you're really, really intimately familiar with every VM and every workload, you can tune your underlying infrastructure to every VM. So because we wanted to build a scalable system that would seamlessly manage thousands and thousands of virtual machines, we thought you know, scaling human resources just to study all these workloads mm-hmm. wasn't feasible for us. So early on, we decided to uh, have all data reduction always on. So we don't even expose any knobs to disable or enable any kind of deduplication or compression or erasure coding. It's always on all the time for all workloads. Uh, of course, we had to design our distributed file system to make it always fast with always on compression. Uh, just to repeat, we have always on compression and deduplication on flash, on disk, in flight. We have erasure coding always on. And no, no, there's no even control to disable this. And just to visually show how we scale into different dimensions. So if you want to scale performance, you add more and more compute nodes. If you want to scale capacity, durable capacity, you add more data nodes. You can provision these uh, components individually, potentially from different vendors. You can install more flash at uh, pay and server uh, margins um, whenever you want. Reconfiguring servers has no impact on, on, on the cluster, especially on this durable storage. So that was another decision, unlike HCI, where server maintenance or reconfiguration, mm-hmm. adding more flash, has, generally has a significant impact on the entire cluster, usually by reducing the level of protection. Sometimes you even have to take the cluster down. Not so in our case, because our compute nodes are completely stateless. Logically, they're stateless. You can shut them down, you can move them around, you can reconfigure them. No impact whatsoever on durable storage. So essentially, servers remain servers. Um, And as far as the scaling limits, uh, we scale to 128 compute nodes today. This is a currently shipping product and 10 data nodes. And we'll look at performance a little bit later, but just to give you a flavor, uh, we can go up to 18 million IOPS and uh, 200 gigabytes uh, in read throughput. Uh, and that's, by the way, with all disk uh, um, data nodes. We have two flavors. We have all disk and all flash. 
Um, but these hero numbers are... are uh, the, the numbers are cited for all disk, actually. Um, and as far as the writes throughput goes, for example, 32 kilobytes of random writes, we can uh, scale up to 8 gigabytes a second. Now, the actual deep dive part. So, uh, so this is uh, your classic uh, I.O. Um, diagram. So we'll start from writes. And so what happens here is that a virtual machine um, runs on top of a hypervisor, which mounts DVX as a basic NFS data store. So a VM write uh, to us looks like an NFS write. Mm -hmm. And uh, the processing happens right there on the compute node that executes the VM. Right, so the intercept point is right there because the, the, the mount point is local. It actually terminates in, inside of the, the SX server. Correct, correct. So, so we get the data before it goes, it goes on the network. So it's right there. And the interesting side effect is that the VM does not create, the running VM does not create load for other compute nodes. So it behaves as you would expect. The VM generally creates load only for the compute node where it executes. So a VM writes to an NFS data store, uh, immediately upon intercepting the write, we compress it and we store it in the RAM buffer on the compute node. At around the same time, uh, we also, to guarantee data fidelity while the IO is in flight, we also write it to an NVRAM um, module on the data node. And here, what's on the network is just a compressed write. And the latency of the operation is uh, essentially the latency of the compressed write to the data node over a 10 gigabit network. Internally, within the data node, there is mirroring that makes sure that the uh, write and flight is actually durable on two independent controllers. And um, at this point, we have essentially three copies. There is a, a ephemeral copy in the ROM of the compute node. Right. We use it for data processing, but we don't really rely on it for durability. But at, this, at this point, we still haven't acknowledged the right back. That's to correct. The VM. And we so don't. There's, there's no risk of data loss. There's absolutely no risk of data not. Right. So we do have a in ROM copy on the compute node, but it's just to accelerate your processing. But until we have two other durable copies on the data nodes, uh, we don't acknowledge anything. Once we do guarantee uh, two copies on data nodes, we... Um, and, yeah, so that's okay. all the way outside of the, the ESX, or all the way down to the data node before it's that's acknowledging. Correct. So that's that's correct. correct. So that provides a similar guarantee, actually a little bit higher than a traditional array. With a traditional array, you generally have two durable copies. In our case, you have two durable copies and one in one copy more. elsewhere, just in case. And then the acknowledgement uh, is sent back to the VM, at which point the VM IO terminates, the hypervisor in turn takes that acknowledgement and acknowledges it to the guest virtual machine, and the virtual machine you know, carries on with its business. And so the latency here is essentially around trip uh, of, um, a, of writing a compressed data block to um, NVRAM. So presumably there's a little bit of latency to do that compression DG. And then there's one network round trip. Uh, there is. So we don't do the dupe at this point just okay. yet. So uh, the, the risk cost of compression, so we do fairly fast initial compression. Uh, we benefit here because unlike traditional arrays, compression is completely declustered and scaled out. Mm -hmm. And it happens on the node that executes the VM. And in our environment, usually you have about, you know, in order of magnitude, more compute nodes than data nodes. Mm -hmm. And compute nodes also have more modern, faster cores. So you do you do pay the price of online compression, but in general, uh, that's not the dominated factor. The dominated factor for the inline ride is actually the network. Um, and on a 10 gig Ethernet, we're talking tens of microseconds. Yeah, that's right. So it's also a millisecond for write as well. So this is the end of the inline part. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, the true heavy lifting happens afterwards. Now, the VM is off and it you know, continuous executing. In the meantime, we have to finish the write, and and this is where uh, there is very close integration with our file system. So what the file system that backs DVX is a scale-out log-structured file system. Mm -hmm. uh, so log-structured file systems go back to early 90s to UC Berkeley. Uh, I vaguely remember the project when I was there, but basically the observation when the project was started, even back then, the observation was that because RAM, you know, memory was getting plentiful and cheaper and larger, uh, you generally could satisfy reads from RAM. And 
whereas writes, uh, and this is where you need to guarantee data fidelity. So writes were the ones that needed optim optimizing. And uh, it's even more true today because with Flash, especially with Flash, you know, Edge Flash, like in the case of DVX on compute nodes, uh, all the reads are essentially satisfied from the Flash on compute nodes. And it's right that we need to optimize. So we made a decision to go with log structural file system uh, just because, you know, it has many, many benefits. Um, it has benefits for Flash itself. Almost every FTL in the market today that drives individual SSDs is based on log structural file system mm -hmm. ideas. And for us, um, because remember I mentioned that we didn't want any uh, any knobs or controls exposed to the, um, to the administrator, uh, we wanted to have built-in um, compression, deduplication, and erasure coding from the get-go. Well, the best way to do compression and erasure coding is actually to use a, a log-structured file system. The reason being it allows you to write data in fairly large sequential chunks. And in fact, we do full stripe writes, and we'll get to that in a minute. And that's what one of the, the fun places where what works really well for high latency spinning media that turns absolutely out correct. working extremely well for um, for flash media where you can't just random overwrite. That's absolutely true for a different reason. Completely so different log reason structured file system was invented 25 years ago when disks were really, really slow. And the main observation was, well, you could still get a lot out of them if you just don't write randomly. Hmm. Because uh, band disk bandwidths even today if you look at SSD versus disk, disks are not that horrible. They're maybe one, about 30% of what you get out of SSD. And here I'm talking about sort of middle of the line commodity Stream, components. But streaming rights. But that's right. If you, if you only know how to stream rights, and if you think about it, the cost of a, a gigabyte on disk is still about 10 times cheaper than an SSD. So you can largely get the same performance out of, uh, out of spinning disks by spending less money. And this is why the performance numbers I cited were actually measured on, on a disk system. Mm -hmm. So, um, but going back to our uh, second phase of the I.O., um, so after the inline stage completes, we keep accumulating, uh, we keep accumulating writes on, um, on the compute nodes, mm -hmm. and we keep doing that until we have enough accumulation to erasure code a full stripe. And, and that's actually on the order of tens of megabytes. Uh, the reason we want to do that is we, we want to we have a distributed system. And we want to avoid a very common problem in RAID called read modify write. So generally speaking, if you look at a conventional storage, primary storage array, oftentimes they use a component called a RAID controller. And these are specialized hardware systems that are essentially designed from the ground up to deal with read modify write system by you know using memory buffers and, and so in specialized hardware, essentially by transforming random writes where you can into sequential writes and 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 throwing expensive caching at it. So it works in a single uh, storage appliance. It doesn't work at all in a distributed system like HCI or like DVX. So here we don't really have a centralized bottleneck because everything is distributed. We cannot just add a piece of hardware to one node and you know and route all the data to it because that would defeat you know the, the purpose of the system. So here we, we actually use software techniques. And essentially we rewrite the entire file system in a way that allows us to write full stripes to um, potential up to 10 data nodes at a time or more. Um, and uh, and also at the same time the stripes are full erasure coded. And because we never override stripes in place, also as a, as a side effect of using log structured file system, uh, we never have to deal with read modified writes. So our writes are very, very fast. And that read modify write we normally see as being a RAID write penalty, the, the four to one write penalty that you see on a RAID. Four to file. one, or in the worst case, six to one. If you're doing double parity. That's right. So with double parity, and by the way, we believe in double parity because you know history has shown that. While dual disk failure may be uncommon, what is very common is when one drive fails, be, be that SSD or hard disk, and you start rebuilding it, you will see, uh, very often you will see single sector errors. Uh, 
And while the second drive may be still up, if you lose one or two sectors, and if you have a single parity, well, you have a data loss. Yeah. So, but going back, and, and, and basically we avoid read modify write, um, and read modify write, the reason you go up to four or six IOs is that uh, to uh, complete a small write, uh, which is smaller than the size of a stripe, you would have to read the uh, potential entire stripe back, recompute one or two parity bits, and then write everything back. And it's, it's for primary loads, it's basically impossible. So if you have a database and that's how your system is designed, I do not believe you can, um, you can obtain any reasonable IOPS out of a system like that. This is precisely the reason why the majority of HCI vendors that actually have any form of erasure coding usually reserve it for only cold workloads that mm -hmm. don't do small writes. And it's up to the administrator to identify such workloads and enable that feature only. And it's a useful feature because, you know, it gives you up to 3x capacity um, improvement, again, if you use two parity. So in our case, all parity calculation and all erasure coding is also performed by compute nodes. And this is in line with the general philosophy where everything, every heavy, all heavy lifting is done by compute nodes, all compute. And upon completion of a full Stripe ride, the data is finally removed from NVRAM and the whole cycle continues. So that was writes. But going back to the origin of log structure file system, so it's a write optimized file system. So it assumes that reads are somehow handled elsewhere. And in the old days, it was by basically allocating a big RAM buffer on, on your storage controller. Well, in our system, we do something different. Although we do use RAM buffering, but we also use massive commodity caches on compute nodes. And again, because we moved out all durable storage out of compute nodes, uh, here we could use practically any SSD for most vendors because it's just an accelerator. We can lose SSDs on compute nodes. It's not the store of records. It's not a data loss. It's situation. not a data loss this situation. One of the things I was seeing also is that the erasure coding and, and the, the full stripe writes is really relevant down on, on the data node but it's less critical sitting up on the compute node where we've got the cache devices. And That's I guess correct. this is where we're heading in this. That's absolutely correct. So erasure coding essentially is applied to the data node, to the durable pool. And this is an efficient way to guarantee protection against two simultaneous drive failures on the durable pool. Because we have this guarantee, and in spirit it's similar to what you get out of pretty much all high-end arrays today. Uh, that requirement got relaxed somewhat with HCI, and hopefully over time they will also discover that you know drives fail, and the more drives you have, the more likely you have data loss. But it's absolutely correct because we have this ironclad guarantee on the on the data nodes. We don't need the same level of guarantee on the compute nodes because it's just you know logically it's just a cache. Sizing wise, we actually size it in a way where you all your active data lives in the edge flash on compute nodes. But logically, it's still not a store of records. There is no possibility of losing data, even if you lose all SSDs there, right? So that, that enables us uh, to, to have several things. First, our HCL for uh, flash devices is very permissive. We pretty much support all the you know vendors of significance today. Um, we support low-end flush, mid-tier, of course, high-end flush, it's up to you. And, and going back to the LFS idea, all the reads essentially come from, uh, from compute nodes. So you don't see reads on the network. And the, and the reads aren't affected by any of the erasure code Absolutely uh, not. potential behaviors, the, the potential for slower I.O. because it's spread out. Because usually right. with a, with a uh, log structure file system, they sequentialize random I.O., but they That's then right. randomize sequential I.O. Well, we actually do both. We have a way to actually sequentialize I.O. So you can, in fact, stream uh, data in sequential I.O. order, in LBA order. But uh, it, you're absolutely correct. It's irrelevant for reads because reads maintain their own caches uh, that are not erasure coded, actually, at all. Mm -hmm. And they have their own, the caches have their own deduplication, always on compression. Everything happens in line. But because we have a leverage durability elsewhere, we could be extremely space efficient with caches. And, and caching happens at two levels, both from RAM and from SSDs. And that was the most common case because we size our system using commodity flash. Generally speaking, all executing VMs, 100% uh, of their working sets, actually the entire VM fits in the cache um, of, of the compute nodes. 
There are some uncommon cases where there could be a fault of a compute node, either hardware or software. And in those cases, we have a way of streaming the data from durable uh, data nodes. And just a few other examples. So that's all fine, but what about these high-end features like the motion? Yeah. Because what if VM moves from one compute node to another, and I just said that, well, the VM fully lives in the cache, and suddenly it moves elsewhere, and now what? Well, we have a way of our software, it has a way of tracking the origins, the genesis, the genesis of a virtual machine. So once a virtual machine arrives at a compute node, uh, if we start seeing messes in the cache, we have a way of reaching out to one or more uh, potential source nodes for that virtual machine and, and fetch the data and also pre-stream it from the previous homes of the virtual machines. So this way, you can think of it, the worst case after the motion uh, is similar to all flash arrays, where the data is in flash one hop away. And of course, the best case, because we do the duplication on both source and destination, you know, if similar no, it's virtual, a global scope of deduplication. Uh, the duplication on Flash is actually local. Uh, on this, on on the data nodes, it's global. On Flash, it's local because we don't want to go with but, the network. But the, yeah, but the the, this, the understanding logical, of the, DG, the logical is, Lo is logical global. scope is global. So if it's the same data is already present there in the context of some other virtual machine, we will find it. All right, and of course we can prefetch data from other compute nodes we are streaming upon the motion. Uh, after the motion immediately completes, writes proceed as normal if there is no change to the right pass. So that was the motion. Another interesting question people ask, well, that, that's great. What happens if compute node goes away, if it dies? Because here you have your, you know, your commodity flash, you have all these commodity components. It's not an array. You know, things happen. It's not redundant hardware. Yeah, we're buying the uh, six servers because they're that's cheap right. commodity. That's right. Maybe a white box, it goes away. So what happens? Well, so VMware has some support called VMware HA, which would automatically restart your virtual machine on another compute now. But we also have software that helps VMware in addition to restarting the virtual machine. It, uh, we also have a way of actually fetching the data in the optimal way. And this goes back to your question. Well, Erasure Code may have a problem of actually writing the data in the right order, not in the logical order. Well, in our system, we actually untangle this IO and try to preserve an actual right stripes in the logical order. So uh, upon detection that the virtual machine is now running after following a fault of a compute node, it finds itself on a different compute node. Uh, because we have also global index for all the data in the system on durable storage, we can satisfy in line IOs immediately from durable storage but we can also upload sequentially yeah. the working set of a virtual machine. So after HA, there's going to be a dip in performance. There would be a dip in, there would be a dip in performance uh, if you're using, as, as remember I mentioned, we have two kinds of data nodes. We have disk-based data nodes and we have flash-based data nodes. And if it's a disk-based disk data, data node, uh, you would see a transient dip in performance, absolutely until the cache upload, essential cache warm up completes. And we have ways of speeding it up by exploiting the high bandwidth characteristics of spinning disk. Mm. However, for tier, some tier one workloads, even following you know, complete compute node failure, that may be unacceptable. So for these situations, you can actually buy a data removal flash node. So in this case, the worst case behavior following a compute node failure, it's very similar to an old flash array. So because yeah. you'll be doing random reads from an old flash node. That's all fine. So this is the IO architecture, but what does it give us? And well, it gives us a few wonderful screenshots like this one. So this is a screenshot from a system that Dell helped, helped us to put together. And it shows over 12 million random read IOPS, uh, over 48 gigabyte per second bandwidth. Uh, I think this system was a fairly, the hardware was not exotic at all. It was commodity servers, Dell yeah. servers, commodity SSDs, uh, no NVMe, no, no Optane, uh, where you, you know, for crash con conscious, but uh, the point, that basically we get performance here from superior scalability and superior software architecture, not from throwing money at individual hardware components. So that was, of course, a toy scenario with 100% reads, albeit across a very wide LBA range. Perhaps more realistic, this is 70, 30, random 8K. Mm. You still scale, again, the same uh, moderately priced components, commodity SSDs, uh, read optimized SSDs, you scale to 1.6 million IOPS, uh, 12 gigabytes per second. The last slide I want to show 
is that is actually realistic. It comes from an independent organization that runs um, I.O. Mark. And uh, so here's a measure of performance. It's not a benchmark, it's performance of actual virtual machines. And they have a system where they add more and more tiles, where each tile has a mixture of uh, databases and other workloads. And as of right now, our submitted result uh, verified by this organization is 10 times better than any other HCI system and about five times better than the best uh, old flash array uh, by IBM. All of these numbers were obtained with all compression, deduplication, erasure coding, and encryption. In this you case, can't all, all because you, you cannot disable at rest encryption as well. Uh, we have both at rest and on the wire. Yeah, you have on the wire all the time. But because yeah. following our philosophy, we use compute now to encrypt everything. So you, that's a unique feature that arrays cannot really match because they don't have an intercept at the compute node. Excellent. Well, that was a. Uh, very in-depth look at, at the IOPath and, and the thorough coverage. Uh, thank you very much, Boris Weiss, for, for joining me. And thank you. Please uh, keep watching the wonderful V Brown Bag Build Day videos with Datrium.